Welcome to the Modern Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Giordani. Special guest today, a veteran, someone who has 49 units that are under construction, also has multiple units already, owns a media company as well. Welcome, my friend Josh Villarreal. Thank you, Josh. Thank you for having me. Of course, bro. So we actually were just like getting into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where... um, you're not from San Diego, but we no. met in San Diego at some private mastermind groups mm-hmm. um, through like the real estate space. Where'd you grow up? How'd you get started? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so first, I, I was born from uh, two hardworking immigrant parents, and they immigrated from the Philippines to LA. So I lived there for 17 years of my life. And then, uh, due to unforeseen circumstances, when I was 14, I ended up. Uh, being pretty much by myself because my parents were forced out of the country. Oh, no way. So I was bouncing around with my aunt, my mom, or uh, my aunt, my grandma. And then uh, at 17, I pretty much had to be the breadwinner Mm -hmm. because it wasn't looking too good for my parents (laughs) over there being Mm -hmm. uh, on the older side. So no one wanted to hire them. Savings were dried up. So me as a 17-year-old kid, I was like, hmm how can I make some money? And then I had the bright idea of being like, okay, uh, let me join the U.S. Navy. So that's, that's the story of how I joined the U.S. Navy. And then uh, I ended up being stationed in San Diego. And cool. I stayed there for about nine years. Okay. And then I just moved to Irvine just Recently. a couple months ago. And then how long were you in the Navy for? Uh, seven years. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. Nice. So that's kind of where like San Diego. How, and how long did you, you stayed in San Diego? Nine years? Is that what you said? Yeah. Total of nine years. Nice, man. And then, so how did real estate come from that? I mean, that's <laughs> yeah. normally people who I meet who invest in real estate or get involved in real estate have had some type of background in real estate, mm-hmm. which is it's cool that you don't, um, <laughs> cause that just goes to show that anyone can do it. Mm-hmm. So talk to me through that a little bit. Yeah. So, uh, me, uh, so going back to the military, uh, I learned really quick that $1,200 a month was not enough (laughs) to support myself and my family. So I was like, all right, what are the side hustles I could do to get extra income? Mm -hmm. So I started drop shipping, e-commerce. I went on offer up, buy and sold, like a whole bunch of stuff, just your regular side hustle guy Mm -hmm. while I was in the military. And then I finally got into digital marketing. Mm -hmm. That did well until 2020. Mm -hmm. So... I was in the specifically the car niche, mm-hmm. and there was no cars outside for like <laughs> m- right. months. Right. And then I had a very big learning moment, which was uh, so one of the the marketing sayings is when no one's marketing, you should double down. Mm-hmm. So what did I do? I had no <laughs> no leads coming in. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, maybe I should double down on marketing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was kind of dumb because there was going to be no <laughs> no cars anyways. Mm-hmm. So uh, I was kind of bleeding money. Um, We were doing our best, but uh, essentially we had to shut it down in uh, like 2020-ish, the beginning. So uh, during that time, I I saved some money Mm -hmm. at at like maybe 35, 40 grand. Mm -hmm. And then um, I was looking at the real estate space. So I've always been into personal development and uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad mm-hmm. was like one of my first books ever, and it sh- totally changed my mindset. <laughs> and um, I, I saw that real estate had a pretty interesting opportunity because no one was buying, but interest rates were like 3%. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're talking 2020, right? This is 2020. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, and then I started talking to um, the team that I built. Mm-hmm. So, I started talking to experts, so I had a mortgage uh, loan officer, I had a real estate agent, I was talking to them, Mm -hmm. and that was my first way of getting into the actual business, Mm -hmm. was just building that team. And then when I was talking to them, I was like, is this, this sounds like it's about a pop, because there's no one there, and interest rates are down. They're like, yes, even though it's super scary right now, you're gonna look back. I actually have a text message from my loan officer, because we were in escrow, 
And my first property ever was an $800,000 duplex in El Cajon. Mm -hmm. So that's my first step into real estate. So I was super scared. scared. Yeah. Super scared. And then um, we were in escrow already. And this was when like no one knew what was happening. Uh, low transactions. Everyone was like, I don't know if I should get into real estate right now, do any big deals or whatever. And then I was asking my loan officer. I was like, yo, this is kind of scary, man. <laughs> uh, is, this, is this the right decision right now? And I literally have a text. He said, look, Josh, I know you, you feel really scared right now, but you're going to look back, and this is going to be one of the turning points of your real estate career. Mm -hmm. And then, bro, I'm getting goosebumps just, just, <laughs> just talking about it. But um, uh, I believed in myself, and I believed in the team that helped me get that deal. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, too, I used my VA loan, so it was 0% down. Right. Uh, so, yeah, that was pretty much how I got my, my first deal. That's funny, too, because it's like you're thinking about, like, being scared. Yeah. Where you're putting 0% down. <laughs> yeah. Super low interest rate. Yeah. <laughs> the price in terms of, like, 850000 like, San Diego, that's not uh, – at that time, it probably wasn't the median price. Mm -hmm. But your rents – would probably cover it even if you didn't decide to, mm -hmm. to stay there full time. What's your mortgage? Yeah, so I think at that time I was at like 4,300 and mm -hmm. it was two single family homes on one lot. So I found it, it's a phenomenal deal. So I, I could break that deal down I'm, too. Uh, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> I'm sure wait, rents are like 3,000 per, per house. Uh, shoot. Uh, at that time, so I bought it and there was already tenants inside. Mm -hmm. One of them, uh, the, it was the landlord's god daughter or mm -hmm. something, bro. They were having a three bedroom, two bath for like fourteen hundred dollars. It was nuts. So I was I was losing money in the beginning for a good amount of, of time. Course, yeah. And then I think the three, uh, the other one was a, uh, also a three bedroom, two bath. Mm -hmm. uh, I forgot the numbers, but um, yeah, I was I was losing like five hundred bucks a month actually. In retrospect, though, it's like, yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, sorry. I think it was 5,600. I forgot where, where those numbers are, but yeah. yeah. Okay. Whatever 0% is for, I, I think I had a 3.25. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. And you still own that today? Yes. Did you develop on it or did you? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. So um, tell me, yeah, let's break the deal down. Yeah, let's break it down. So I purchased the property uh, in May of 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning, because of COVID and all that stuff, it was kind of, difficult to get the tenants out because they were scared too. Uh, and so I was losing money in the beginning, but I, I already saw the potential of what this, this property could do. Mm -hmm. So in the back, just listening to bigger pockets, one of the like small nuggets that I got from one of the podcasts was, Hey, a lot of what a lot of people don't know is if you add a bedroom in a house, it could, your appraisal value could go up to 30 to 50 grand, mm -hmm. especially in San Diego. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like you can look it up on Google and all, all the statistics and stuff. And, it, and I was like, oh, shoot, this is true. I'm mm -hmm. looking at the comparables. And then um, so I saw that I could do that. So that right there, 30, 50 grand in, mm -hmm. in equity already. Right. And then um, so I trusted the process. And once I transitioned them out, um, got them a good spot we, we were helping them out during nice. the situation as yeah, well good for you. Uh, but what ended up happening was um, I I was trying to figure out okay how can I cash flow a lot because after um, doing the numbers I was only going to cash flow like 300 bucks mm -hmm. uh, if I rented it out and did it myself mm -hmm. um, but I was like okay there has to be another way where I could cash flow a lot more. Mm -hmm. And then that's where I got into the rent by the room model. So co-living. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Have you heard of uh, that that model? Yeah, more for, I've, I've seen it for like college kids. Yeah. A yeah. lot of people do it. Mm -hmm. um, but I've never, I've never personally done that model. Do you have a lot of turnover? So the interest, <laughs> uh, interesting enough, uh, our tenants on average say like 1.5 years. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So yeah. how we ended up doing it um, is we marketed to uh, veterans, military people. Okay. So usually they would stay at a base mm -hmm. or whatever for two to three years at a time. Okay. So that's who we were marketing to. Gotcha. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Nice. 
And then you have like 13 units total or 13 doors total? Yeah, so I have 13, um, so I have 10, no, I have nine co-living units. So mm -hmm. in the co-living world, one unit equals one door. Okay. Yeah. And then the other one is four actual units. Gotcha. One, they're, cool. they're like bungalow style. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I feel when I first, um, when I first bought my house, I was, uh, I was very nervous to do to take that to take that leap of faith but to be honest a lot of the things now that i even think about it that we were talking about it i got a heloc um and i was able to take that hundred thousand and start investing and doing flips with the with the heloc so then i was able to double it within three months paid my heloc off then i had you know multiple six figures in cash then i was able to start investing in my own deals my own flips without using any borrowed money so it's just interesting the power of like what real estate can do, especially if you leverage over time. I bought mm -hmm. mine in 2019, mm -hmm. um, ended up paying, I think 335, and then now it appraises like over over a million. Oh my gosh, um, that's nuts. But my mortgage payment is $1,300 a month. It's Ugh. like, I can never, like, oh my I, gosh. it's so hard for me, because right now me and my, um, my wife were looking, it's a small house. Mm -hmm. So we've been looking to like buy a new house. And I'm just like, oh, everything we're looking at is like over 2 million bucks. It's mm -hmm. like massive, um, massive mortgage. And I'm just like, oh, yeah. I love my $1,300 a month. <laughs> it's so yeah. cheap. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I love that. So that that's how you got into the flipping world. Yeah. Using your HELOC. From so, your sort primary. of. So there's two ways. So one um, is I, I had a mentor and I was bringing him deals. Um, and he offered me equity interest in the first uh, in, in some of the deals. So he was giving I think he was giving me fifteen or twenty percent. So in the first four months, I think I, I stacked up four deals and made like maybe seventy thousand or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then I took that and then I was like, oh shit, maybe I should get a HELOC. So then I got a HELOC on my house, and I th my initial HELOC was only for I only did it for a hundred thousand, but it was zero percent interest for the first year. Wow. And then um, I used that to start investing. Uh, for the, my first full year of investing was 2020. Mm -hmm. And I think that year wow. we did eight or nine deals. Um, and I used between my HELOC and between the cash that I had, I was able to do that. And then I was able to pay the HELOC off and then only use my cash. And then um, I ended up getting a bigger HELOC, so I was able to do more deals. So the next year, 2022, I was able to do, uh, I think, double the amount of volume I did in 2020. And then now I've, I've doubled that again, but now I don't even use any of my own cash for the majority of my deals now. So you use OPM? Yeah. Nice. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think the power of social media and like posting and people knowing what you're doing, they want to get involved somehow, some way. Um, and you know, people can't get, make 12% on an annual, annual rate in the bank or anywhere else in the stock market. Yeah. And it's quick, right? I'm turning over most of my deals in 90 to 120 days. That's great. So, um, you know, they invest, they get paid back fast. If they want to reinvest and do another deal, they can do that. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, just become, um, but it's interesting because I just, I w wouldn't have even known how to do this if it wasn't for a mentor. Oh, so you, you had a mentor mm -hmm. that helped you in 2020? Mm -hmm. So the first one? We were doing all of them together. Oh. Yeah, up until recently, I've done um, like four this year by myself and then the rest we've done together. That's awesome. Um, but yeah, the majority of them we would always do together. So I understood the process. It was like the learning curve, like yeah. was cut in half, you know, and that's, it's, it's just, it's huge. Because doing, mm -hmm. I, how you were scared to buy your first house, mm -hmm. I think for anyone to flip their first house is going to be scary. Oh man, like, yes. Are, yes. are they going to be running the numbers correctly? Yeah. Are they going to be able to manage contractors correctly? Are you going to know the correct paperwork? <laughs> are you going to know how to, how to find the right deal and know what price you have to get it at uh -huh. and what the potential resale is all of that, all that like mm -hmm. scary stuff that's involved was taken away because I was able to partner with someone who knew oh, what to yeah. do. So, so going, so going back with a mentor, I didn't have one in the beginning. I definitely should have mm -hmm. uh, invested in a mentor because my first move as a landlord was to raise people's rents. And as you know, in San Diego, <laughs> so for you guys who don't know, uh, San Diego is rent controlled. Mm -hmm. So if you raise people's rents that have been there more than a, a year, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you cannot raise it more than like 5% or whatever inflation is during that time. And then I took the 1400 to the market rent of like 2400 So it was an extra $1,000. <laughs> <laughs> and then I sent it to them. It was just an email. It wasn't like a contract or anything. Hey, right. just let you know, just in a couple months, this is where it would be. And then they're like, 
uh, they messaged back. They were so kind. They were very kind. Mm-hmm. They're like, hey, just to let you know, um, what you're doing is illegal. <laughs> uh, you could get into big trouble with that. And then I was like, okay, copy that. Um, tomorrow we will be uh, having our property manager take over. Uh, yeah. I didn't have a property manager back then, so I found one. Yeah. And then, um, yeah. That was the first thing that I did with with mine. I was like, there's no way that I – if because you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. You know, and yeah, yeah. You, you, you look at things like you wanted to raise the rents because that was what market rent was. But yeah. like not knowing the rules, most people – I don't think most people who are out, even in the real estate space, may not even know what tenant laws are if they're buying their first rental property. Yep. So it's – um, yeah, it can be definitely be scary. That's why I was like, oh, I'm outsourcing that <laughs> real fast. I don't want to deal with it. Yeah. If something, if you know, if there's issues or anything like that, mm-hmm. I don't want to deal with them. I'm definitely a big fan of property manager. I'm I'm a big fan of mentors. I'm a big fan of building a team. I think that's one thing that you learn over time. Like, I don't think I I knew that like mentors or coaches or anything like that was important, but all those things can catapults you I, and I say this all the time on most podcasts like it, it changes your trajectory and you can get to where you want to go a lot faster mm-hmm. now I think this year I've spent like $35,000 on on coaches and or on a coach I have the same coaching company mm-hmm. but that's made me you know hundreds of thousands of dollars right and especially mm-hmm. just the experience of it alone yeah. next year is probably worth millions of dollars mm-hmm. right so yeah so <laughs> for one of my uh the first big flip that I did, mm-hmm. so I picked it up in late 2021, no, yeah, 2020 mm-hmm. to 2022. So it was a bigger flip, full rehab. I'm talking about studs, no uh, no <laughs> a roof. Oh, shit. And then uh, I was like, all right, let's do it. I, I think I have the the best, or not, not the best. Um, I have a decent amount of experience. Mm-hmm that I could take this on. So mm-hmm. I didn't have a mentor specifically for that part. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I ended up losing six figures on that deal. Fuck. Yeah. Just because you don't know what you don't know. No. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, for, for you guys that have never flipped anything, once you start opening walls, it's a whole nother ball game. Yeah. You have no idea what's behind those walls. You don't know uh, if things are really uh, structured yeah. or if the foundation is really that good. Mm-hmm. So it, with with that being said, having a mentor during that time could have saved me six figures. Yeah. Did you get inspections or anything like that before? Yes. Yes, we did. And it, they weren't on there. Nothing. I uh, no, it was not on there. Uh, so there. So anything that could have gone wrong with that deal mm-hmm. went wrong. Interesting. So um, went through three, um, three different GCs. Mm-hmm. Uh, permits were a headache, so I was doing this back in LA. Mm-hmm. So me, I was like, ooh, it, w- it would be pretty cool doing it back in my, my homeland, yeah. hometown, yeah. right? And then so I did not know the lay of the land. Mm-hmm. So I, I was doing the project and then try, just doing my best. Right. But, yeah, everything that could have went wrong, the – the uh, the permitting process in LA, it sucks so bad. I like bet. compared to San Diego, I've done deal like a lot of deal. Well, I've done um, development with uh, like ADUs and everything mm-hmm. like that. So uh, I thought it would be the same over there mm-hmm. for just you know, hey, a new roof, kitchen, whatever. Right, bro, it's horrible. Yeah. Every every mun- municipality is so much different like, to go to the city and get permits, and especially like it, it's on- honestly really important to have a contractor who's worked with the city, yeah, or has connections with the city, because um, a lot of times they're able like even here with with like ADU people, mm-hmm. some of those people already have like architects who have drafted plans and submitted those to the city before that have gotten approved, so they have like these cookie cutter plans that they know that like they can steamroll through the city really fast, mm-hmm. where. You know, L.A., if you're not familiar with it or if you don't hire the right contractor or whatever, like it, it could be it could be a headache really oh, fast. Yeah. I, I've definitely learned a lot. in. <laughs> so this is about to be my fourth year in real estate investing now. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I definitely made a lot of mistakes, but uh, those mistakes is what made me who I am today. Of course. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it's pretty cool that you're you went from like, you know, buying like your first house in 2020 <laughs> and having all these other units to now developing a 49 unit mm-hmm. <laughs> multifamily. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty gangster if you ask me. So how, how is that deal going so far? Uh, that, that one's good. So we just finished uh, all the plans, architects, um, 
and designs mm -hmm. uh, were submitted in the city and we're still in the, the revision process. Okay. So we're projected to be um, entitled between probably April, May. Okay. Yeah. And then are you planning to, um, once they're done and rented out, are you planning to sell or are you planning to refi and keep? So um, right now, refi and keep. Okay. That, that's the plan. We want yeah. to keep everything uh, to the best of the, our ability to keep everything in San Diego. Cause, um, so for the listeners out there, for coastal markets, especially in San Diego, property value doubles every 10 years. So uh, that property is worth uh, like between 21 and 23,000. Mm -hmm. uh, 23 million. 23 sorry. million, I was going to say. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> yeah. My bad. I'll write a check for it. Right <laughs> <now>. <laughs> yeah, so 21 and 23 million. Uh, so if we just keep it for 10 years, you know, that's a $20 million check. Yeah. Um, how much money did you have to raise on that deal? Uh, and you're still raising right now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we're, we're at our, our last stage of uh, raising right now. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so we, we had to raise, oh, shoot. Um, so we're under a 503C, so I don't know if I could say how much we're raising. Okay. But I could be vague, I think. Sure. I'm, I'm assuming it's over seven figures. Yeah, it's multiple seven figures. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, somewhere between, I would say, five and ten. Uh, no, actually. Lower so than five? Lower. Okay, cool. Lower. Interesting. Lower. Yeah. Interesting. 49 yeah. units. What do you think, after it's done with rents and everything else, what do you think you'll, you'll be bringing in in terms of cash flow? Uh, definitely. It's, so... I know it's going to be at least a hundred grand a month. A month? Yeah. That's sick. And then what, um, have you looked into financing and all that stuff after you do? Because I'm assuming you have a bridge loan right now or a yeah, construction so, loan. Yeah, we have a, we actually did a regular hard money loan. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, so that's part of our strategy that we did. Mm -hmm. So right now we got it with the with a hard money loan, and then we turned the units so that we could turn them into midterm rentals. Mm -hmm. So we have four midterm rentals. They're all one ones, mm -hmm. and it's in North Park, so they get rented out like all super fast. Nice. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, I was gonna say going back to having like issues with with um, with flips. I did one this year, and it was my biggest problem house mm -hmm. that I think I've ever experienced. And I got inspections, but I knew like. I always, so like every, every, every house that we buy, sewer inspection, home inspection, regardless, mm -hmm. just for us, just to know, sewer obviously can be extremely expensive yeah. if the lines or if the pipe is, is corroded mm -hmm. or whatever. And then home inspection, just to make sure like if, if it does need a roof, it doesn't need a roof. Obviously we can look at it and see like, ah, there's probably a chance it does, but it just gives us more grant ground to stand on, especially if we need to get a reduction. Right. Um, and it's just for us, like, even if we don't need to get a reduction, it's still important to have it. So we know what we need to do, but I had to do everything. Like we had to trench the house. Oh, wow. Um, I guess it wasn't, I didn't realize this, but it wasn't lived in for five years before. So what? the sewer line from the street was corroded. So they had to trench all the way from the street. They had to trench up all the house, all new sewer lines. So this was like purely vacant for five years. Purely vacant for five years. Wow. Yeah. So all new sewer, electrical, roof. I had to, I had to um, redesign the pool. Like anything that you can think of, the gas line and the gas line ended uh, up coming shoot. up like last minute. We were completely done with the house. Uh -huh. So then we found out we had a gas leak because the gas company was coming on to turn mm -hmm. um, to turn on the gas because we didn't need it on. Right. And uh, we found out we had a gas leak, so they had oh, to trench man. up the garage after it was already like epoxy and all this stuff. And I'm just like, no. Oh. It was an experience. Um, thankfully, I was working with like really solid contractors that like, I'm someone who if if there's a problem, just tell me the solution. Like, what is yeah. it that we need to do to fix it? Yeah. Don't just give me a problem and not have a solution for it. Yeah. Because that's like, I'll get, I'll get frustrated at that point. Mm -hmm. There's always something that you can just fix. If it's not a big deal, mm -hmm. either it's a big deal and it's going to cost a lot of money and yeah. it's their fault, or yeah. it's a big deal. It's going to cost me a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And then what is the time? Yes. But regardless, it needs to get done. So yeah, 100%. Um, you know, I was just glad that they were very solution oriented, like right off the bat, like, Hey, we found this. We already trenched it up. Mm -hmm. It's it's don't worry, it's not gonna be some crazy costly thing, but like it needs to get done. Yeah. So um but I think going through some of that stuff, like even losing your hundred thousand, I'm sure you made up for it. You know oh, what yeah. I mean? Like Well, I could tell you uh like a backstory of what happened after that. Mm -hmm. So uh when uh when I was speaking at uh 
an event here in San Diego I actually uh, shared like how I got into social media. Mm -hmm. So that right there is actually what got me into social media. So <clears throat> in the end of 2020, so quarter four, I was like, shoot, I'm about to lose a lot of money. Uh, one, I was losing money on a deal because of uh, interest rates were going up. Mm -hmm. So appraisals are not the same, unfortunately. Uh, and everyone was getting hit. Like all the top guys, they're, they're all getting like destroyed during right. that time. And I was getting destroyed as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm a little guy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, money, private money was drying up as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was like, man, all right, how, how can I uh, get more deals and, uh, and be more efficient? So I was looking at all the deals that we were doing um, and most of them, all the best ones were through relationships. Right. So I went to my mentors, right? Now I have mentors. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I went to my mentors and then I was asking them, so I'm in this situation right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to be more efficient. Um, so what is the best way to scale our business? And then they're all like social media. We want to grow and make more connections. It's all about the more hands you shake, the more money you make, right? Mm -hmm. So it's always who you know and who knows you as well. Right. So I'm like, all right, I, I kind of already knew I had to do this. I just, again, scared because mm -hmm. now everyone's going to see me. Everyone's going to judge me. So I was like, man, if I have to change, then I, my mindset needs to change as well. Mm -hmm. So December 1st of 2022, so that's right on quarter four, mm -hmm. uh, I posted my my first video mm -hmm. and I told myself something is gonna happen. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is, but I'm gonna post every single day until something happens. Mm -hmm. So my first week, I got like ten followers mm -hmm. by posting every day. I was like, man, I'm putting a lot of work into this. Right. But then it started cannonballing. Um, so I uh, was learning, testing, and then by the third week, I had. 13,000 followers. Oh, wow. And then by the end of it, I had 25,000 followers within 30 days. No way. And then 40 days after that, so 70 day span, I ended up having 100,000 followers. So uh, it was just because uh, I've been doing this for a while. Like, like I was telling you, I was in uh, the hustle digital marketing space for mm -hmm. a minute. So I, I had a decent amount of knowledge on business. Mm -hmm. So I just started sharing that, and then, yeah, so it was not very much overnight, mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, just seven years into 70 days. Dude, that's crazy. To do, so I've been posting twice a day for the last, I think, 60 days, um, and I think I've grown from, like, 800 followers to, like, 1,600, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, I think that's, what, double? Uh, but for you to grow to the, where you're at, cause now you're at 150,000 or something like that. Yeah. We just hit 150, like two days ago. It's crazy, dude. Yeah. And that's a year. Yeah. It was, I think it was like right on, right on the dot a, a year. I hit a 150. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And explain to me, like, I have an idea, but for people listening that like want to grow their, their social media, like to me the way that like people look at someone like you is almost like a celebrity figure, mm -hmm. right? So when you're talking about building better connections and things like that, yeah. talk about like what the difference is when you had no followers oh, man. versus <laughs> now having 150. I know it's like, I'm sure it's weird, right? It's, it's probably very a weird. very weird feeling, Yeah. but I could imagine, um, like to me, you're just a normal person. Like we've, we've seen yeah. each other in person. Like yeah. to be honest, I didn't even know like, who you were like when we first met mm -hmm. and we, I think you and I were the only ones that like talked to each other the whole time. <laughs> and yeah. then I left. Um, and I still don't know that I would treat you any differently, but I think other people would look at you as like a celebrity figure. Mm -hmm. Um, but it is powerful. Like having that, that many followers talk to me about like what the difference of, or what doors that's opened up for you and why people should maybe like create an audience yeah, uh, or build an audience. <laughs> so first of all, uh, the experience of not having it, um, to where, where I am right now, it is very weird. Like, I don't think humans were built for this much attention at one time. Cause sure. every time I post something, I got 150,000 eyes now, right. like looking at me. So right. it's different feeling every time I post something. Mm -hmm. Um, but 
Yeah, every time I, I go into like a, a real estate event, like I went to Ryan Pineda's uh, conference a couple months ago, mm-hmm. and then I swear like 50 people went up to me. Oh, that's cool. Is yeah, I'm yeah. like, what the heck? This is kind of cool and weird at the yeah. same time. Right. Yeah. Um, but for the the relationship side, uh, you carry a lot of authority. Mm-hmm. Uh, so back in uh, 2021, I believe. So back in 2021, I went to my first conference. It was the All In conference that uh, Carlos Reyes mm-hmm. uh, threw. Are you familiar mm-hmm. with? Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. 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 Cool. Um, so I went there, and then me, I'm a very curious guy. Like, ever since I was a kid, I was very curious about everything. Mm-hmm. So uh, I was trying to observe, like, how, like, people move in the background, like, what is wholesaling. So uh, I ended up wholesaling for about 18 months. Mm-hmm. I think we talked about that, too. Yeah. 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 Uh, so that was in the beginning of my wholesaling journey. Uh, we did over a dozen deals, 10 different states. It was a, it was a good journey. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the beginning, I was trying to dissect, like, what are the, what are the doers doing? And w- how did they get successful? And what is the shortcut to that success? Mm-hmm. And then um, me just observing, I saw, like, these guys that were doing maybe $50,000 a month. I know that sounds crazy, but, like, in the real estate world, that's that's – not too much, right? It's not it's not much at all uh, compared to these other big guys. And then I saw this specific person that had, I don't know, 20,000 followers and like uh, 10,000 followers on, on YouTube or something. Mm-hmm. He was getting all the attention mm-hmm. because no one else was on social media. Mm-hmm. I was like, this dude is getting into every room. He's getting all the connections. Uh, he's getting all the deals. Hey, do you do you know someone for this? Hey, I got this deal. Mm-hmm. Do you think you can help me with it? And I was like, what the heck? And this guy was younger than me mm-hmm. at that time. And then I was like, yo, social currency is a huge thing in business. And then um, that was when I was like, all right, I definitely have to get into social media. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> going going back now, uh, when I when I am in those scenarios like social currency weighs very heavy Mm -hmm. i've met people now that i (laughs) i was low-key watching on youtube but Mm -hmm. now like i see them every day we hang out every day right um and like there's someone that uh uh i'm meeting today i'll tell you after Mm -hmm. but it's gonna blow your mind who i'm meeting today Mm -hmm. after this Mm -hmm. um but yeah it has opened so many doors and definitely everyone should do their best to, uh, if they want to grow in that way, Mm -hmm. put themselves out there. And it is scary, but I can tell you that it's worth it. Yeah. No, I, I could see it it was, it was scary for me to put out my first video and they were, they were awful. Yeah. Right. Uh, and then over time, I think you just get better and better because I don't think like anyone is comfortable just being on video talking to, uh, a camera. Mm -hmm. Right. And then over time, I think the more consistent you are, the better you are on video, the more practices, the more repetition, the better you get. But I, I know even not, and again, I don't have a big following, but I get business through my DMs all the time because it's the right people that follow mm-hmm. me from like the real estate space here yes. that send me, you know, potential flip deals um, or, you know, just a better connection or like us, like we didn't necessarily, we met in person, but mm-hmm. like over time built a better connection over, over social. And it just puts you in better rooms. I think the biggest reason why I started one was because I want wanted more flips and wanted people to know what I was doing. Mm-hmm. But the second thing is I want to be around people who are doing more and more things than what I'm doing mm-hmm. to open my mind of what's possible. And I right. think like this year, 2023, it's opened my mind to like, I never thought in a million years that I could make six figures a month. Right. Never thought mm-hmm. I, I made it possible. Right. And if it wasn't for me putting myself in other rooms or being around people who were doing that, I would have thought that it was just a figment of my imagination. Oh, so yeah. um, I definitely can see how it could be a powerful thing. And that's like the ultimate goal for me. Yeah. And I love the mindset that, that you have, because when you do post something, let's say it gets 2000 views, a thousand views or mm-hmm. something, you just virtually shook a thousand people's hands. Right. And now you do that at scale, getting, you know, a couple thousand a month. It's mm-hmm. huge. You're yeah. shaking a lot of people's hands. Right. Yeah, it's crazy. It's cool. It's a powerful, it's definitely a powerful thing. Um, 
what are your goals with um, with real estate, with social? Like, do you have any big goals for the next five years that you that you want to accomplish? Ooh, five years! Wow. Um, Everyone thinks so short term, so I'm like, <laughs> I want to throw out a five year, and then we can talk about short term. Yeah, yeah. Uh, five years. Um, so, <sighs> the the overarching goal, if anyone asks me, I, I say like a billion asset. Uh, a billion dollars assets under management. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then I, s- I started reflecting on what I really want. Cause once you have like a certain amount of baseline of like your food is covered, your you get to go on trips and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Uh, there's Maslow's hierarchy, I believe it's called. Mm-hmm. Um, but basically uh, once you have your baseline done, you, you have the top, which is uh, trying to find your purpose and alignment. Mm-hmm. So the things that I, I really want to focus on is just uh, my personal freedom. Mm-hmm. So freedom of, yes, peace is is a, a continuous thing that we do. Mm-hmm. But I personally don't want a lot of stress. Mm-hmm. So thinking about doing a billion dollars <laughs> assets under management, if it happens, it's great, you know, mm-hmm. but... What I care about right now is my long-term vision in five years is fully retire my parents. So fully retire your parents. So uh, for people that don't know, there's a statistic out there. It takes $3.5 million to retire one person Mm -hmm. now today Mm -hmm. comfortably. Mm -hmm. At 60, right? Yeah. Yeah. So now I have two of those parents. Mm -hmm. So that's $7 million for me. Mm -hmm. That's net to pay for them, whatever. So that's my goal. That's, that's a big goal. Mm -hmm. Right. And then the rest is just, uh, building a business around how I want to live, not a business that tells me what to do. Mm -hmm. I like that. Does that make sense? A (laughs) hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I love that. I feel like finding a purpose is one of the things like, uh, Alfred and I talk about it a lot is like, once you can find your purpose, you wake up with fire every day. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think I, I've found that over the last, uh, 12 months. I think it happened as soon as I, um, got engaged and then now married, but it was because I think I was working towards, I was only being selfish and working towards the things that I wanted, which was probably, you know, let's say money right now it's a bigger purpose Mm -hmm. right now I have employees now I'm taking care of other people um my wife you know being able to go and travel and do whatever we want and take our families to dinners and like live a life that we want to live that we've designed um is so important and that's I mean that's I feel like that right now but Mm -hmm. I still you know like with flipping it's um and I don't know if you know this I still have a w2 job so oh I did not know that yeah that's awesome so flipping has uh been part-time like still part-time. That's so cool. Yeah. So, um, I, what was my point behind that? Um, so it's just, it's just one of those things. Oh, that was, oh, that's what I was going to say. Flipping is like, you, you're always trying to look for the next deal mm-hmm. when you're buying rentals and you're building like wealth through rental rentals. It's like right. buying a stock, right? It's just sitting yeah. there. It's collecting. Yeah. You know, you're not even looking at it. You're not checking on it. It's just cash in the bank. Even if it's not cash flowing, cause mine don't cash flow. Mm-hmm. Um, but mine in terms of appreciation, because I bought those deals as flips, like, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, both of them, I think put together is over a million. So, um, you know, that to me is more important, I think, than cash flowing. Wanna, okay. I love that. Um, and so, especially in today's market, we can get into that too. Yeah. So <laughs> buying a rental right now, like I want to ask you, why is buying a rental such a no brainer? Like people don't understand about like the four things you could get by buying a rental appreciation, tax benefits, cash flow, which in California is, is very much non-existent right mm-hmm. now. And then principal pay down. Mm-hmm. Um, those are the four things I just did a video on this recently mm-hmm. for me. And especially like for us investing in California or San Diego, it's virtually impossible to cash flow on deals. Mm-hmm. The only way you can cash flow on deals is if you're putting a significant down payment and I'm someone who likes to pull my cash back out to go and recycle it to buy more deals. Mm-hmm. So if I'm, if I'm having to leave my cash in there, if I'm putting, let's say if, if it needs 20% down, mm-hmm. Even with 20% down, most likely it's still not going to cash flow. Right. But if you're buying those deals right, like I'll give an example. I bought a condo in Encinitas, mm-hmm. west of 101, paid 465. 
it appraises at 930, 45 days later. Oh my gosh. So, and I only put $45,000 in this place. Uh, Actually, it was less than that. It was like 30, 30,000. Wow. But I'm negative a thousand bucks a month. Mm -hmm. But after principal paying down, the tenant paying down the rent, after the appreciation that I already had on that deal. And again, I kept that because it was such a good deal mm -hmm. that it was just worth it for me to keep. Um, I was able to do a cash out refinance to pull all of my cash out of that. So I, I'm in it for no cash, but I'm negative $1,500 a month. But after tax benefits, it will wipe that clean. Yes. So that's what people don't see is that, yeah, that when people think about uh, buying a rental, they're thinking about the cash flow. Oh, what can I make right now? Right. But they don't know that those four things. Depreciation is a huge thing, especially uh, if you do it right. You can mm -hmm. write off W-2, 1099. Mm -hmm. And wipe up the whole thing, especially if you pair it up with like a bonus depreciation yep. play. Right. Oh man. Yeah. yeah. It was funny. My wife came home the other night. And she's like, you know, she's in she's in the real estate space, but like, you know, doesn't maybe not understand like the investment strategies yeah. and things like that. And she's like, you know, why don't we look at these other markets like Ohio or Kansas City or mm -hmm. or places where, you know, maybe you can get cash flow. Well, those markets don't appreciate as what they do in San Diego, but also like our time is valuable. Mm -hmm. Our resources are, are local in right. California or in San Diego for me, maybe LA, San Diego for you. Mm -hmm. um, and so I can find better deals. Like for me to find a better deal here to walk into an ex, you know, instant six figures of equity, mm -hmm. but be negative. Like, I don't care about buying a $200,000 duplex right. in Ohio to make $250 a month in cash flow. Like, to me, it just that's just not exciting for me. It doesn't yeah. even cover my car payment. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? 100%. But for some people, that could be a strategy. It's just not my strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, li I like that point as well, where people invest in the Midwest, right? So it's definitely uh, dependent on your situation. Like if there's someone that's super busy in their W-2 mm -hmm. and all they want is cash flow. So for example, um, if you're in the low income housing space or affordable housing space in that area, mm -hmm. like you could cash on cash 20%, sure. right? Yeah. So cash on cash, you're not gonna get that much appreciation, but if you put in like 100,000 down, uh, you could cash flow a good amount mm -hmm. to where you could take some time off work, right. give you some freedom to work on whatever it is you want to do. Yeah. And then you can start flipping or whatever. Of course. And, and, and if we were in Ohio, yeah. it would be a different story because yeah. like, we're familiar with the market. We mm -hmm. know what's there, the population, the growth areas, the, the, the areas that like maybe prime and ready for appreciation. Yeah. Um, like there, we were, I was talking the other day to someone about like COVID markets. Mm. And markets where like people were, were heavily buying Airbnbs, but now mm. that's not the place to buy Airbnbs. It's mm. too saturated. Like you talk about like the Scottsdale's and the Palm Springs, yeah, right? Like people, those, those areas and they're all these new regulations. Mm -hmm. So the regulations are, are getting huge. bad. Yeah. Do you know the, the one that just came out? Um, so they're proposing a bill right now in California. Mm -hmm. Do you know about the 15% one? No. Uh, -uh. yeah. So, um, I think it's called, I, I forgot what the specific name is, mm -hmm. but basically uh, California is putting a tax on all Airbnb hosts of 15% of revenue, bro. That's crazy. Where, where are they going to, where's their profit now? What a lot of people don't know is Airbnb is usually between 15 to 25%. Right. In terms of a, a property manager too. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the property manager itself. Yeah. Oh my God. My property manager, I think is 20 or 25%, something like that. Um, but we're also on a wait list to get ours to be like on a daily rental list. Mm -hmm. So that's challenging too. So like understanding markets and not like going to a market just because it was a popular destination during COVID. Yeah. A lot of those people are probably getting hit a little bit. Um, yeah. but it is what it is. Mm -hmm. What do you think about, um, uh, have you, I'm sure you saw that article floating around of the fed reducing rates six times oh my in gosh. 2024. What was your thoughts on that? Uh, so yeah, it was, I, ING, chief economist of some big company or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, he said that they were going to cut, that Jerome Powell was going to cut rates six times in 2024, mm -hmm. right? So for the people that don't know what that means is usually what happens is the Fed's funds rate is directly correlated to mortgage rates, people borrowing at a certain uh, level. So the more money we can borrow at a good rate, the more cash is going, people are trading properties, assets, and basically everyone makes money. Mm -hmm. So uh, if that happens, right, because we don't know if it will really happen, um, I would get very prepared to for the tsunami of buyers coming into the market. Mm -hmm. So right now is probably the best time 
to buy a rental or get into real estate in general. Yeah. Just because, look, okay, let's say, so interest rates are dropping right now, actually, right? Mm -hmm. It's at 7%. Like FHA was at like 6.75 or something. I saw, yeah, I saw FHA and VA were in the sixes, yeah. Just nuts. Yeah. Right? So it's going down really fast. Uh, what what was the top? It was like almost uh, 8%, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So that's a huge drop just mm -hmm. because of that news alone, right? right? So right now it's a decent rate, but uh, there's less competition. Right. A lot less competition. Everyone is scared, but there's a saying that we both know, which is buy real estate and wait mm -hmm. rather than wait and buy real estate. Right, 100%. Because, because people that wait and buy real estate, that pretty much means that you're trying to time the market and no one has a crystal ball. No. And that's the one thing that I actually didn't like mm -hmm. about that article because I truly don't believe that he's going to reduce rates six times in 2024. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, and a lot of like, you know, agents and, and lenders are posting, posting it, which, yeah. which I get, it, you know, it could create some type of like positivity or people to get off the fence or people to hold off to wait till 2024 to buy. Mm -hmm. But one thing that that's going to do is cause extreme chaos in the real estate market. Mm -hmm. Like I think we'll see home prices appreciate the fastest that they ever did in yes. one year. Like aside from like, I think more than what COVID did. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know that that's a good thing for the market. N no. Uh, well, so history likes to repeat itself, right? right. So do you, are you familiar with what happened in 1980s? Mm -hmm. So uh, for the viewers or podcast people out there, uh, in the 1980s, a s very, very similar situation happened where uh, we had inflation, the feds uh, increased the interest rates, and transactions were low, no one was buying. But then right when uh, interest rates started to go down, within, I think it was two years, appreciation went up 30%. Yeah, that's crazy. 30%. So in San Diego, like just waiting two years of, our, our average right now is like 923 or something, mm -hmm. or a mil mm -hmm. in San Diego. Probably, yeah. So you made 150 grand a year just holding it. Yeah. Yeah, it's nuts. They call it the, the Volcker because Paul Volcker was in office. Like, so he was Jerome, he was Jerome Powell back mm, then. Back okay. then. Um, but he, uh, he over, over tightened, which that's why I think it will repeat itself because Jerome Powell has also not indicated that he's going to reduce rates at all, which yeah. you can't say. Yeah. He, he can't. You can't. But um, I think doing six rate cuts in 2024 is going to be a will be a scary thing. I think for yeah. other economical factors, economic factors, I think it's probably needed. There's probably rate cuts that are needed. Um, you know, with with commercial real estate being in kind of a weird a weird place, yeah. um, with borrowing money, the cost of money for businesses and all those things, like people are struggling. So I do think that rate cuts are going to be important because the consumer is struggling. Yeah. But I think it will uh, still cause chaos that I, I think may, may be a little too much. Yeah, because, right, so um, in, a, in a basic economics, there's always a second effect, yeah, right? right. So when they're, <laughs> they're cutting down rates, you don't see the effect of it till 12 months later. Right. So we're in that 12-month mark, so it's showing that everything's going down, everything mm -hmm. looks looking good, but then once they start raising rates, we're not going to see the effect of it no. until 12 to 24 months later. Right, and that's kind of where we're at now, yeah. right, with them yeah. raising rates, and I think we've seen that with the effect of the consumer, Yeah. Um, you know, with credit card debt being at the highest it's ever been. Yeah, it's bad. And then the... Um, I, I'm sure you saw the auto defaults, like the defaults on auto loans is the highest it's ever been since 2008. So I think, you know, for the average consumer, I think people are, people are struggling. So I think the reduction of rates will help. I think, uh, it, that that's correlated to credit cards too. So I think it mm -hmm. will help with credit cards with their adjustable rates and things like that. So we'll see. I, I do think that if it does happen six times, it's political because of the election year? Uh, that's the other thing. So in 2020, when there was such a big, uh, they, were, they were trying to save the economy, mm -hmm. basically in 2020. Right. And that's exactly what they're going to try to do in 2024 because of the election year. Yeah. 2020 election year, 2024 election year. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely curious to see what happens. Yeah, me too. But only time will tell. And that's the thing, is like all those news articles and stuff, I think I have to focus, especially like with flipping and stuff or, or buying rentals, you have to focus on like the macro economics, like oh, yeah. in terms of inventory levels, where interest rates are, where demand is, yes. kind of look 
at what that looks like. Mm -hmm. Like if demand is dropped and interest rates are are high, mm -hmm. right? I'm not going to base buying a house right. on what just sold yeah. in the last 30 to 60 days because I think prices will get affected. Oh yeah, especially if demand's down and interest rates are up. So, mm -hmm. so um, yeah. With, with with that being said, with uh, like demand going up, salaries staying baseline mm -hmm. or just staying the same, it's it's not helping the economy, no, right? No. So um, I, I didn't tell you too much about like my the co-living background that I'm doing, right? Mm -mm. So, <laughs> oh yeah, I, I didn't even finish the the full deal. The story? Deep dive. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So going, going back to that. Um, so I did the co-living model. Mm -hmm. I ended up, uh, because it's a VA loan, I had to live in there, mm -hmm. right? So I house hacked. But instead of doing a regular house hack, I call it a super house hacking because I had multiple units and then multiple rooms. Right. So it's not just a house hack, it's a super house hack. Right. Um, so I ended up cash flowing $1,900 a month instead of 300 mm -hmm. and live for free at mm -hmm. the same time. Right. And then, excuse me, uh, during that time, I was like, yo, this is pretty cool. I love real estate right now. Right. I, I just made some equity. Um, what's the next step that I could do? And then I started getting into... ADU development. I was mm -hmm. like, oh shoot, this is pretty cool. And I have a perfect opportunity right here. Mm -hmm. It's a, uh, so in the back of the duplex, two single family homes, right? They had a three car garage, it's huge, mm -hmm. three car garage. And I was like, that can definitely be a garage conversion mm -hmm. right there. So I started doing my numbers and then um, I was like, all right, I got, it's going to be about 70,000 to do it. Mm -hmm. I was like, all right. Where am I gonna get that seventy thousand? <laughs> I'm like, uh, so at this time I was like 23, 24 mm -hmm. years oh, old. <laughs> um, so I was like, okay, how can I do that? And then I started learning about cash out refinances mm -hmm. and all that stuff. And because I rehab both properties, so I ended up rehabbing both the properties mm -hmm. to uh, 2020 standards. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a whole vlog a vlog on it on, on my YouTube channel of like what I did. Mm -hmm. um, so I ended up rehabbing both to 2020 standards, put about 40 grand into it. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up getting uh, like a $96,000 uh, profit check. Oh, wow. So that helped a lot. So I had that plus the money that I put in. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, all right, cash out refied 0% down, mm -hmm. VA loan. So I had no, no money in the deal now. Mm -hmm. So I did a full burr mm -hmm. with no money. <laughs> so I went no money. That's crazy. <laughs> and then, um, so I used that money instead of like buying something dumb, right? When people get a six, pretty much six, six figure, figure check. check. Buying a Lambo, a Rolex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I was like, all right, I think this would be the best uh, bang for my buck, which is the ADU. Mm -hmm. So I ended up spending, uh, so the original was about 63,000 for everything to do the garage conversion. Mm -hmm. But then of course, uh, things that aren't always things smooth. Yeah. yeah, things come up. So it ended up being like 72,000 and mm -hmm. some change. And um, it took nine months, but th that 72,000 and nine months made me $323,000. That's crazy, dude. Just that right there. Just, that was like, what, four X? Or I don't even know, how much, how many X is that, five? It's almost four. Almost four, right? Yeah, almost yeah. four. Yeah. Or so, maybe it is four, I don't know. Can't do math in my head right <laughs> now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, and doing all of that and doing the co-living model uh, the results from that was I bought a $800,000 duplex, mm -hmm. did co-living on it, cash flowed pretty well, did ADU on it, cash flowed really well, did uh, uh, refinance. I left money in there, mm -hmm. so I, I left about uh, 10%. Mm -hmm. And I pretty much made uh, $700,000 in equity on that one deal. In, in a span of two years. And what, what does that cash flow produce now? So because we're doing the co-living model, uh, it produces around 5000 in cash flow a year. That's crazy. And you're not living there anymore. So that's, no. that's the 5000 is like not free, but yeah. Yep. That's awesome, dude. So after all expenses and everything. And um, going back to the, um, like the things that are going on in, in the economy right now, like it's getting very expensive to rent. Mm -hmm. So... Um, so the statistic right now, there's 14 million renters, and 33% of them live less than $35,000 a year. So how are they going to afford a $1,500 studio, $1,600 studio? Yeah, I mean, the only way is, is, is to do what you're doing, right? The co-living the co spaces. Yeah. Um, I was just talking to a friend yesterday, and as, as bad as this is, like, the median income, like, 
for you to be, I think there's lower, the lower and middle class now, like mm-hmm. m- middle class is like, unfortunately, I think it's, it's like six figures. Yeah. I mean, it's like 125,000, I think is still mid- middle class. Cause it's so hard. I was doing the math the other day of like, what can you afford to buy in San Diego yep. with a $125,000 annual salary, even if you're W2 Mm -hmm. after car payments, taxes, everything else, like you're, you're left over with maybe a thousand dollars a month after rent, but then to go and buy something like what can you afford? Maybe $500,000. Yeah. Like with current interest rates, it's so tough. And I think the affordability, like the gap between it's going to create like a rental economy. Well, the other thing too is savings. So that's mm-hmm. another thing that people right. uh, or the government tracks is savings. Mm-hmm. Savings is at all time. Uh, it's a 20 year low or something mm-hmm. like that. Right. Uh, so yeah, that's why I believe co-living is, is going to be a big thing in 2024. Sure. Just because I don't think they're going to raise salaries anytime <laughs> soon. No, and they have gone up a little bit. I saw, but mm-hmm. not like, like where it needs to be. Yeah. 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 And then, especially with the interest rates going down, appreciation, like, if you buy a house now and the appreciation and the interest rates, like, yes, a lot more people are going to afford it, but the payment is still going to be around the same still because right. of the appreciation. So um, there's, like, big people going into the space now, like um, Mark Cuban. Mm-hmm. So are you familiar with Pad Split? Uh, I think I've heard of that, yeah. So Pad Split, uh, they've been around since 2017. Mm-hmm. Um they're, uh, they just got evaluated for like uh, somewhere like low nine figures or something. Okay. And one of their, their main investors is Mark Cuban. Just because they, they see, like uh, I've seen the data behind co-living. It's pretty nuts. It's growing at like 15% a year. And it's only going to grow more. <laughs> That's, isn't the pad split thing where you're like, let's say I own a house on a yeah. lot and then the, you're able to like split it one time to put like a mini, like mini house on it basically uh no so um i think you're, you're might be talking about sb9 oh maybe okay yeah uh so so pad split is just uh it's pad split is airbnb mm-hmm. so basically me as a co-living landlord right mm-hmm. uh, i would just use them as a a platform to help manage get tenants all that stuff oh, interesting but uh the co-living itself, it's just getting a single family house. Let's say it's 1,800 square feet, 2,000 mm-hmm. square feet. There's four bedrooms and like three baths, mm-hmm. right? So what you do is you convert like the living areas that people, you don't want people hanging around because uh, there's going to be uh, unwanted visitors, mm-hmm. staying too late, making noise, parties, whatever. So what uh, Pat Split and all these uh, people that pull in a lot of data is that people don't really need a living space. They just want a place where they could have an affordable rent, where they're comfortable, safe, mm-hmm. and they get to save their money for the next stage in life. So mm-hmm. it's a lot of young professionals. Right. It's very like dorm style. Yeah. So it's a really cool concept. And then um, so they would convert like the dining room into a room. They would convert the, uh, the living room into two rooms. Mm-hmm. So now you have three. But then each space in San Diego right now, so... Uh, each room for me is between thirteen fifty and uh, nineteen hundred dollars per room. Wow. Yeah. So all you got is furnish it, put it in there. And then what a lot of people don't know as well is uh, San Diego is the highest demand for midterm rentals out of the whole United States. Hmm. San Diego. Uh, I think there was about I think three hundred thousand inquiries last year, but only 30,000 available units or something. Dude, that's nuts. That's yeah. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely interesting on how the, like the studios, I mean, you're seeing a lot of those people do like the developments of like with the one bedrooms or just the studios on like the TPA stuff, the yeah, yeah, yeah. priority area. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, most of those ADUs developments they're doing are all one bedrooms. They're not doing two bedrooms for affordability purposes. Oh yeah. Like uh, for our development right now, uh, I believe 42, 43 are all studios. Yeah. They're studios that are, are built for one, one. Right. So it's a, it's open, but essentially there's a, a balcony where it's a loft. Right. We're, we're doing loft style. Units. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's crazy, man. Um, do you want to go over some questions before we wrap yeah, up? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Do you have, um, do you have someone on your side too? Um, let me see. I, I think I told them to, to go to your oh, page. Gotcha. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. Mm-mm. Thank you, sir. 
Um, okay. The first one. I think both of us will just answer both of them together okay, or cool. to answer them together. Um, is consistency Madison? Hi, Madison. Is the consistency really the key to the success? Yes. Yeah, I think it's a very straightforward answer. Yeah. <laughs> I think you have to do things. And the reason why I think consistency is so important, it's like in the gym, right? Repetitions every single time. Like you, you, in order to get better, you need to consistently do the same thing over and over and over again. Yes. And the reason why you become successful is because you're doing the same thing for a long period of time and just getting better at it. Mm -hmm. That's my short of the long answer of that. Yeah, no, I agree. And then using the same analogy in the gym is that the more reps you do, you're going to tear something, mm -hmm. right? But every time you learn something new, you mm -hmm. never lose, right? No, you don't. Uh, you, you never yeah. lose. Yeah. You only learn, and now every time you do a rep and it hurts, it just gets bigger and bigger, sure. so you're stronger for the next one. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I don't ever think there's a – you may lose. Yeah. But it's, it's a learning experience that makes you grow and you get better from. Yeah. There's a saying that I love. Uh, Ed Milet made it like famous, or at least I think mm -hmm. he made it famous, which is life doesn't happen to you. It happens for you. Mm -hmm. So everything that happens to you, it's there's always a reason behind it. Yeah. And like for me, when I lost that money six figures, like uh, I'm like this year, next year, I'm going to be making seven figures and right. yeah yes yeah. yes yeah, it's great dude. yeah um okay next question this one's an interesting one um you have 20k washington state no investment properties yet what would you do uh, say, say that again sorry uh you have 20k okay i'm assuming she she lives or he lives in washington state no mm -hmm. investment properties yet what would you do 20k uh one the, the best investment, is, Alex Hermosi says this, is invest in the SME 500, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So that's what I would say. Invest in yourself. Find a really good mentor that has done what you want, the lifestyle that you want as well. Right. Just because somebody is successful, they have a nice car, is not the exact lifestyle that you want. So that's something that I learned. Mm -hmm. So I look at someone that has the same lifestyle that I want. And then, uh, yeah, so spend that money into your knowledge and uh, so you can take action as safe as possible. Yeah, and I think it's like, like, like you said, like learning, just learning a skill, yeah. right? Like if I, if, if, let's say it's flipping. Yeah. Per, good example. $20,000 may not get you very far in terms yeah. of flipping, but like let's say you um, invested in a coach that taught you how to flip or how to wholesale. Yep. You take that 20,000, you can turn it into six figures really fast. Oh yeah. Right. So your, your ROI is huge on just investing in yourself and yeah. finding, um, finding a skill. Yeah. Like for example, $10,000, you'd invest in a, in a good mentor. Good mentors are going to be expensive because yeah. you're, buying their time. They're very expensive people. Right. Yeah. So let's say $10,000, but they're going to teach you how to find a great deal, mm -hmm. how to raise money. So that 10,000 just multiplied to six figures. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. And you could do it really fast. I think people just don't realize that. Yeah. Um, not that it's a get rich quick thing, but yeah. like it's real, it's real. Yeah. Um, what is the biggest risk, um, that you took and what did you learn from it? Ooh, biggest risk that I took. Uh, um, I don't, that, that's a great question. Cause I take risks every day. I know. <laughs> I think risks become like, I know where I'm at today. Yeah. Um, like I'll answer that for myself. There's never a time where I feel like I've ever taken, like I obviously, even with my money, like mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands come in and out of my account, like w monthly. And I can look at that as a risk or an experience. And I don't think there's ever a time where I've felt like I was uh, being risky. Mm -hmm. um, like I quit my job or I've, I've, I've had things that have happened to me who like other people from an outside perspective may have considered that risk. But to me, it's like you just have to do it. I think the only risk that people are taking just in general that I see is the lack of action. Mm -hmm. Like asking two, it's important to ask questions. But when you get to too many questions, you create indecision mm -hmm. and you don't take the next step of taking action. Analysis paralysis. Yeah. 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 Now, I, I would definitely agree. Um, so for me, uh, the biggest risk. So the question is, what is the biggest risk that I took and what did I learn from it? Mm -hmm. uh, so there, I, I have a lot of examples. So let's just start with real estate. 
with I was so scared <laughs> with my first, first deal. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, even though I was scared and I knew it was risky, so yes, real estate can be risky if you don't know what you're doing. Mm-hmm. But since I had a decent baseline of my team telling mm-hmm. me, all right, they they've been in the industry for like ten uh, a decade or two, mm-hmm. so they they have a, a good sense of the market. So just having somebody around you to minimize that risk because there's always going to be a risk something might happen Mm -hmm. but the thing that i learned from it was uh (laughs) the thing that you're scared to do the most uh usually means you're in the right direction yeah i like that yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense um okay last question Uh, my buddy jared favorite uh story from the navy (laughs) (laughs) favorite story from the navy oh my gosh uh Oh, I, I got one. So <clears throat> I actually have a lot. But the a cool one that I really liked was I got to work with the SEALs for a little bit. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, so this was back in the Middle East. We, we dropped off. We pretty much traded um, 1,000 Marines mm-hmm. for 12 Navy SEALs. So we dropped them off, and then we picked up 12 Navy SEALs for a really big ship. Mm-hmm. Uh, so during that time, uh, I, I work as an operational specialist. Mm-hmm. So I work with like communicating with uh, crafts, helos, all that good stuff. Mm-hmm. And then we were in uh, a combat zone. Mm-hmm. So we were three miles away from like a war zone, like mm-hmm. an actual war zone. There's mm-hmm. fire everywhere, mm-hmm. all that good stuff, right? And then our job was to uh, police like the, the waters in between. Mm-hmm. So our team was like going into all the boats and stuff. But me, I'm in a dark room talking to people, right, making sure the operation is going good. Mm-hmm. And then one of the coolest things that I've done in the Navy was uh, <clears throat> I was I was on the radar, mm-hmm. and then I was like, hey, uh, is, there, is anyone seeing this? There's a, it looks like there's like a little skiff or something. Skiff is uh, like a little boat, right? Right. So I was like, there's a, there's a little skiff over there. Hey, you guys want to check it out? It's like, uh, a Navy, like a Navy SEAL came in. It was like, that's a good eye. And then, uh, Dude, literally, like 10 seconds later, a freaking cobra just goes in and says, okay, we're clear. Oh my I, was God. Like, I was like, yo, that's pretty dope. So that's one of the stories. Damn, that's crazy. That's super yeah. cool. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, I'm sure there's a ton of stories <laughs> from the Navy. Yeah. Um, well, cool, bro. Well, thanks for coming on. Appreciate you. Where can everyone find you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram, Josh Villarreal, and it's the same thing on YouTube, same handle, Josh Villarreal. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for coming on, bro. Appreciate you. Appreciate it, man. Thank you for having me. Of course.